Hello, and welcome to our program, Where God Weeps, a program in which we speak about the situation of the suffering church around the world. Today, we're going to consider the missionary work of a religious community called the Missionary Community of St. Paul the Apostle, a public association of the faithful of the Catholic Church, made up of priests and lay people from different parts of the world. Their charism is to live the spirituality of Christ the Good Shepherd, spreading the missionary spirit in the style of St. Paul the Apostle. The community, already active in Kenya, Ethiopia and South Sudan, in late 2009 traveled to Malawi in order to find a place where to start a new parish. After getting to know the different dioceses, it was decided that a mission station would be set up within the Archdiocese of Lilongwe in the area of Benga. A general study of the area in 2011 revealed that although the area is near Lake Malawi, 85% of the people are agriculturalists. The literacy rate stands at about 70% and around 76% of the population are Christians, Catholics about 12%. The study also revealed the extreme poverty of the area, the need for evangelization, education, and health care. To tell us more, it's my great pleasure to welcome Father Manuel Hernandez, a Spanish priest in the community of St. Paul, working in Malawi. Welcome, Father, and thank you for being with us here today on our program. Thank you for uh, taking us today here, and it's very nice to, to share with you our experience in Malawi. Malawi is the third or four more poorest country in the world. When we arrived in Malawi, we traveled from the north of the country to the very south, and then the east to west. We just ran across the country. We decided to settle in Benga. This is the place that was mostly in need. Poverty comes in education, comes in health assistance, comes in nutrition and we are trying to work on that. One of our charisms is to alleviate the suffering of the people, to lift up the standards of living and somehow give dignity to, to the way they live. The most clear suffering we see in people is the physical suffering. You see the bellies of the kids because of malnourishment or you see the elderly that is just pure bones because they are, they are not having any food at all. How you see somebody who is becoming blind, you see one, two, three, so many cases. And people are somehow slaves of, of these diseases that can be easily cured. People plant mostly maize. They use very basic methods. When the harvest is poor, they have less food. Since the produce is less, they normally concentrate on children and maybe the youth. So the elderly people, they're not cared for. They get very little food. Even the houses where they live, they are in very, very bad conditions. Very tiny, some have no windows at all. Some you find that the roof is completely out and uh, no one is bothering. So we started a program we visit the most forgotten ones of the elderly people. And you find that they are the ones that are sick, the ones that cannot walk. When they age, they become weak. And uh, I think that's when they need us most. They are the last point of their lives. It's our turn to take care of them. When their roof was blown off, this one that used to be like a store for keeping the things and all that, that is what they use now as a, as a place to sleep. But when it rains, the whole of the floor gets wet. Then they suffer from uh, pneumonia and this kind of diseases because of sleeping on the ground. 
mavuto watu ndio mimi ni ndara kuragari kuti tima kala ndi mavuto makaya za chuma ndalama ku iga mabwera ntawo ya vula ya zinja tima sokira a Christ kunoko kuti kana na kobedi ndi choncho sawazo zikazoti thandiza ngati akaura kuti tsaso bino lino ma November so sikone ka munawo ndi tedza We are using the garden as a way to teach people and the children of the nursery how to produce vegetables. Here we have the goats. These goats are hybrids. And what we do is we change them to the people for the local goats, because these ones are much bigger and produce much more milk and especially much more meat. We used to have 1,700 students but uh, less than eight classrooms. They used to learn under trees. They would look at uh, the vehicles, they would be running around while the teacher is teaching, so it was difficult to control. The classrooms which we have behind here, those classrooms were constructed by the parish, and we are very happy. We had a problem here, dropout, high absenteeism. When you call the parents, they will tell you there's nothing we can do. They cannot come to school on the empty stomach. We are also getting other groups coming to come and assist us. In, in a month, we will be able to give food to 13,000 children in school. They will get a plate of simple porridge, but that porridge will help that they attend to school, and at the same time, they will be able to be well focused when they are in class because they have something in their stomach. So that's a source of happiness. The education is the future, and for me, it's the key of the development. Mostly, we want to teach them how to speak English, how to communicate in English. It gives you an opportunity to have something to do in the future for your own life. At the beginning, you may get a bit of stress or you may see how I'm going to do this. But once you see the problem is solved or once you see that somebody is cured or you see that somebody can go to the school and is doing very well, it gives you like peace inside and happiness and it's difficult to describe. Maybe one child does better or family gets a better nutrition because they have better seeds or access to better farm inputs, then I feel that, okay, we are on the move. The parish is preaching love. They have taught us to love one another. When there is love, we try to push ourselves much further than even that our strength can allow us. Sometimes we need to come out of our comfort for the good of someone else. There will be a lot of happiness when we all look at what we are able to do together, and together we grow. Giving is not an action that is because I feel good or I need to do it or whatever. It's something that is the other person deserves and is our responsibility. If we set all of us in that motion of serving, of being attentive to the needs of others, then suddenly we realize that there is joy, that there is a life that is fulfilling and meaningful, and we feel strength and power to move mountains and to bring change into people's life. Then suddenly we realize that it's our own life that is changing, and, and we feel an immense happiness and joy. Father, a first question, your founder, and I'm going to read his name here, Father Francisco Andrea Garcia, always encouraged missionaries to embark on impossible projects in the most remote and least equipped places in faith, hope, and charity. Would you say that upon your arrival, 
this was an impossible project, or rather better said, what were the challenges you faced when you first came to the Benga diocese? When you arrive in a new country, it's like uh, you are born in that country. You have practically very little knowledge of the culture, of the people, how things are work. So it's a big challenge altogether. Give us a picture, a little bit. Where are we? We are in the central part of the, of the central region of, uh, of Malawi. And dry or what? No, kind? we normally have four, it's a quite hot and uh, dry area, but not dry as such. Uh, dry during the dry season. We have three main se seasons. Then we have uh, the rain season, January, February, March, up to April. Then a cool season. And then we have a hot season from September, October, November. But during the, is an area that gets a lot of rain as well and it's plenty of rice plantations and plenty of, uh, of other crops, but related with, let's say, hot weather, weather like cotton or rice or paprika. So we'd say a bit warmer than the interior part of the country. Who are the people? Who are we talking about? Mm, we have mainly Chichawa people, but also there are other tribes as well in the, in the area and uh, traditional people, agriculturalists in large majority, I would say 85-90%, uh, very, very rural, uh, we don't have big towns at all, and now little by little covered by telephone and electricity, but till a few years ago with absolutely only just the road, but no good communications. The people themselves, they, they're the Chichewa people, they come from the area or they came in, I've read somewhere perhaps that they even came from the Congo, that they had moved in from Congo, or are they native to this area? Chichewa tribe, they are Bantus, and the belief is that they were coming from, from the west part of, of Africa, Congo, but they settled, and after they settled there, they have been for maybe two, three hundred years uh, living in the whole not only Malawi, but also Zambia and parts of Mozambique. They are, they are Chewas as well. And they are mainly agriculturalists and collectors. They have a reputation of uh, being a very old uh, tribe, uh, I think almost back to the first century, and um, having elaborate religious traditions. Can you tell us a little bit about their culture uh, and their, their cultural expressions? They believe uh, Nowadays is, is quite limited, or let's say is very, very little remaining, but still they have their own traditions and tradition in the spirits, the spirits of good, the spirits of, of evil. They represent them with, uh, with the masks and they represent also that they could come in the form of animals and in the form of things. And they practice a bit, the, that culture though it's every time more and more becoming something cultural, more than a practice, a real practice. But still we have some people, they do, and in some parts of the country still is strong, not in ours. Some missionaries have been accused in the past of, of eradicating the culture, coming and putting a, another foreign culture on top of the local culture. At the same time, I've done some travels and encountered missionaries where, the, in fact, the missionaries and the church are those that are keeping the, the local cultures and trying to keep them alive. How do you find yourself in relation to this issue of the local culture and also trying to encourage what's good within a culture and keep what's good within a culture? I don't know if I have enough experience like to talk about this, but what I understood myself is that many, many people, they will substitute or they will, let's say, live like in two worlds, being Christian and at the same time still believing in these cult cultural practices. So that, uh, I think, is in opposition with your belief, and that is why many missionaries, they, they try to, to fight it. Either you are in one side or either you are in another. You cannot be Christian and Muslim at the same time, so you cannot be practicing the two things. Myself, what I understand is that we have to try to put or portray this as a cultural thing, as a part of the culture of the people that is nothing to do with the faith. And if this thing is kept as a cultural practice and this thing is kept in that concrete area, I think it's not in contradiction with the other thing. But this also has to be made underst understand to, to, to the people. 
So if that is made understood to them, I think the, the two of them can just live together. And they're open to God. They're, I mean, I suppose, uh, if I understand correctly, it's, it's no longer primary evangelization. Now it's a question of catechism, of rooting the faith. But when the first missionaries came uh, into the area, were the people open to God? Was there an understanding of God as a concept of a, of a, of a single God? Or were there many spirits as you, and many gods? How did, how did primary evangelization take place in this area? I think people were, my understanding is that people were really open uh, to God and people have a very deep faith and belief in God. What happened is that you have the traditional dances or you have the traditional things that they dance in the evenings and people join them because they like and because they consider part of the culture. In fact, that is, if you conceive that thing like an interference, that it could be a kind of a, a clash, a kind of, of a tension. But if that thing is, is as I said before, leave aside, mm. it will not be any problem. But my belief and what I see in, in our parish and with our people is that people they have a very deep belief in God and a deep faith. Because they see that uh, in all the problems they are facing every day and all the challenges by themselves, they cannot solve. And then God is part of that and they trust in God and they put their faith in Him to solve that problems or to, let's see, to, to see what is the will of God in the day by day challenges. In fact, as you mentioned, the people are deeply religious. You have many different uh, religious traditions in your area. If I understand correctly, it's Catholics are 12% more or less of the population. A bit more nowadays. A bit more nowadays. <laughs> Christians are, how many would you estimate Christian population? In our area, yeah. it could go up to 60, 70%. And then there's Islam. There are also a good presence, maybe 20% of them. How are the relations between, for example, Unfortunately, we hear now more and more of challenges between Islam and Christianity, also in Africa and Nigeria and Zanzibar and so on. How is it in, in Malawi? Malawi, I think from all West, there has been a very, very good cohesion and relationship, and we have no any problem at all. I think some of the actual problems that have been provoked, somehow traditionally communities that are living in peace without any problem, and we have many, many families in, in Benga, in our parish, that they are uh, in the same, same family. The wife belongs to one denomination and the husband belongs to another one. Like in the Catholics, half of, of our families, they are mixed families. Mm -hmm. And we don't have any problem. Each one is praying in his own church and each one has his own belief. And I think there is a perfect uh, relationship. You have a funeral and everybody will attend the funeral because the culture, that is to attend the funeral is going on the top of whatever denomination. You have a Catholic funeral and the Muslims are present and they are helping. So I see the cohesion and the relationship between them is perfectly manageable, no problem at all. Father, we, you mentioned earlier a little bit about the question of food security and, and you've been doing a lot of work in this area. Mm -hmm. What was the challenge to the question of food when you first arrived? and what programs did you put into place to help the question of food security? One of the main problems I found in the food security is that people that are working very, very hard and they get very little profit of that work. Why? Because sometimes they, when they get the harvest, they are, first of all, they, the cultivation is done with a very rudimentary methods. So then it's very little results coming out. You find many people with very little pieces of land so the, whatever that comes out of it is, is, is little, maybe not enough for a family to survive. Then when they get this, they are pressurized because many months without income, then they have to sell on the high, on the low season when, when everybody has harvest, the prices are very low. Then with that little money, they have to survive almost the whole year because it's only one harvest. The fertilizers are extremely expensive because they come from outside. The price of the crops are extremely low, so it's very, very difficult. It's a multiple challenges. Yes. So then we started several programs. One of them very interesting is uh, we collect uh, crops from the people and we pay them on the market price. 
when the, when the prices are very low, so they have a first income in the month of June after harvest. Then we have some stores in the parish and we keep it. And when the high season comes that the prices are going very high because there is a scarcity of them, we sell them and now they get a second income. income. And we normally from the profit 20% we keep it, we are making a kind of a cooperative and 80% it goes back to the farmer. So they get a second income in the, tri in the time of, ha of hunger, that is in the months of January, February, when they are planting. So in that way, they get a, a right price. So we have started with 150 farmers, and this year we have done with 80, 90 tons of groundnuts. So we are little by little increasing and seeing how the thing is doing. But it's one of the ways. The other ways is to try to help them to subsidize uh, fertilizers and to give them different type of seeds. So they don't concentrate only in groundnuts and maize, but they have to start with soya, with beans, and diversifying the legumes, following the policy of the government that is going on that line, to try to make them the income to be diversified and better as well. And the cooperative, obviously you're seeing good success, so the cooperative is growing and growing. Do you feel the impact of climate change at all? I have read and heard that in some countries in Africa, the rains are not coming or the rains are delayed, and this is having a significant impact on the people. Have you encountered the same? Last year, we have a lot of problems. We, we have uh, heavy rains, and after heavy rains in a few months, uh, when there's still the crops were growing, we have like three, four weeks without any rain at all. So the maize when was flourishing and giving the crop dry. So we have a terrible hunger situation and we were doing relief in, in 20, early 2016. So somehow I believe is it's, climate change. It's a fact. Yeah, yeah. Education is also a concern. I want to read here, 56% of the population has completed primary studies, but only 20% completed secondary studies. What is the challenge? Why are these numbers so low? And uh, what is the church doing to address this problem? The situation of education is, is quite terrible. And for me, development, the key of development comes with, with education. If the country has a manpower that is prepared and is educated, it has the, the potential to grow and develop. Uh, in Malawi, one of the, for me, one of the challenges is the, the children are learning Chichewa at home. And in theory, from the first to the fourth year in the school, they're learning Chichewa. But suddenly, on the fifth year, they're supposed to teach uh, to learn everything in English. So how can you manage to know English if you never have Experience, practice? Yes. And four years, you were only doing in Chichewa. So that is a very, very, very big challenge. And then you find that people with money go with good schools where English is all through. And people without money, they go to the day schools where the level is very low. The preparation of the teachers is not good because they were the HIBS some years back killed many of them and still this has not been yet fully replaced. So there's a very big challenge on a the scarcity on the, yeah, of teachers. On the side of that. And I think all this is a kind of a combination that they make uh, the education to be very, very low. That is one of the main challenges of the country. We started uh, three, four nursery schools in the parish to give a good uh, level of learning, nutrition and, and education from, uh, from three years up to six. And then later on, we started a private school where everything is primary school, everything is done in English. And at the same time, we are trying to reinforce the primary schools around the parish, uh, building classrooms. Some of them, they have 1,500 students for eight classrooms. So it's impossible that in the race season they have a place where to learn. So many, they go home without any kind of, of learning. And we are trying to reinforce them building new classrooms and trying to reinforce uh, and help the government in, in that. At the same time, in secondary education that is private and they have to pay for, we are trying to support uh, students. We have around 180 at the moment uh, that we are supporting to try to combine what is primary, secondary, and tertiary education to try to lift up the level of the education of the whole area of influence of the parish. Father, you've spoken about food, security, education. 
what it what other area would you say is the big area of your responsibility of course other than the spiritual i'm talking very much more of a practical level here is there one more area or another area where you are investing yourselves for the good of the people we are trying to do a bit with health that for me is the third leg of when you try to talk about development and dignity of the of the person just in the areas that they are not covered by the hospital in, the, in we have there like uh, we are having a dermatology program and we have an ophthalmological program on service with some doctors, friends from, from Spain, that they are doing campaigns, and we are trying to raise up that. The rest is on the hands of the, of the hospital of the area. Father, you did master studies in Spain. You mm -hmm. went very early to the missions. What would you say the missions have brought you? Oof, uh, they have brought me many things, I would say. The, the missions is uh, for me is my life and they make uh, in my case uh, the ones they are molding you and they are the ones that they make you to learn and and they teach you so much and sometimes we think we are going to help but at the same time they are helping us so so much and the people we are working with we are serving too they are also helping us so much i would say much more than we are helping them so for me, it's difficult to describe, but it's like a kind of combination of many factors. You've got enormous challenges, challenges, challenges. Every day it must seem like a challenge. How do, you, how do you manage it? How do you, in your faith, with your faith, do you sometimes say, oh, I'm never going to see the end of the challenges? I think I learned something from Africa. And is, uh, here in Europe, we have a very uh, individualistic way of approach things. It's me, my challenges, and I'm supposed to overtake them and to fight them. And in Africa, we put ourselves in the hands of God. And then you do whatever you want, but the faith and to leave God to intervene as well and to trust in him is very, very important. So many, many times when you see I have done what I was supposed to do, now we leave it in the hands of God and let's see what he tell us. Father Manuel, thank you for having been with us today in our program. Thank you to all of you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for having been with us today on our program, Where God Weeps. And if you'd like to know more about the situation of Christians, Catholics in Malawi, in the Benga region, in the parish where Father Manuel is working, I would encourage you to look at the contact information at the end of this program. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Take care.